It's Dr. Leave. Yeah, so we'll be talking about male fertility in oncology patients. Uh, learning objectives were sent around. So just as some background statistics, an estimated two in five Canadians are diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. And as can be seen in this graph of new cancer diagnoses um, and cancer incidence rates in Canada in 2014, a significant portion of these patients are actually under the age of 60 and even under the age of 50. For these patients, the mortality rate is relatively low. And actually now, since 2016, the average age of men at childbirth is around 34 years old, and the number has been rising. So what that means is that a large number of patients will be diagnosed and treated for cancer while they're within their reproductive years. And many of these patients uh, will be impacted by infertility. The pathophysiology of infertility in oncology patients is complex and multifactorial, but uh, cancer physiology, especially in testicular cancer patients, as well as patient predisposition and the management of the cancer can all result in infertility. Um, so for decades, we've known that patients with testicular cancer actually have poor baseline fertility compared to the, the general population. And this is seen in studies dating back as far as 1983, um, where, where patients have decreased semen quality if they are diagnosed with testicular cancer. So as you can see in, in this table of 218 patients um, who have been diagnosed with testicular cancer, they had a lower total sperm count, sperm concentration, in vitro penetration compared to reference values. And the same study also looked at uh, testicular histology in these 218 patients by doing biopsies of the contralateral testicle. Um, and they found that the testicle is usually dysgenic. Um, and so they have tubules containing only Sertoli cells, which are often poorly differentiated. Um, and they can have spermatogenic arrests and even carcinoma in situ. Uh, and then the same trend of poor fertility in patients with testicular cancer is actually also seen on a population level. So this is another study from uh, 2000s, which shows the fertility or the number of children in patients with testicular cancer in black compared to the general population in white. And so patients with testicular cancer had fewer children compared to healthy controls, even before they developed uh, th their cancer, suggesting that they may have been less fertile at baseline. There are several theories for these alterations in, in semen quality, um, which include an elevated intrascrotal temperature, direct destruction of testicular tissue, alterations in blood flow, and then secretions of things like HCG. But uh, one of the main theories currently is something called the testicular dysgenesis syndrome, um, which is a theory that testicular cancer and decreased uh, fertility have a common origin in fetal life. And this is born from an observation that cryptorchidism, hypospadias, uh, germ cell cancers, and infertility are all risk factors for one another. And so the theory is really that environmental factors and genetic defects during fetal development can cause testicular dysgenesis. So this impacts both Sertoli cells and Leydig cell function, and then results in reduced semen quality as well as CIS, which can cause it testicular cancer. Uh, this theory is supported by animal studies. So there's several studies in rats which have been exposed to DBP, exogenous estrogens, and antiandrogens, and all of these have a dose-dependent induction of cryptorchidism, hypospadias, as well as impaired spermatogenesis. And then histological examination of the testicles in these rats demonstrates the changes that are predicted in the testicular dysgenesis uh, syndrome hypothesis. Although it's important to note that in the rats, there is no occurrence of germ cell tumors, um, but they do have transient delay in germ cell differentiation, which in the studies was thought to be analogous to the homoerotic. Um, 
And then there is some epidemiological evidence as well in humans. And this comes from some temporal synchrony. So for example, it appears that in France, Scotland, and Denmark, birth year and semen quality are very closely related. And then there's a large study of the incidence of testicular cancer in Danish men. And a table from the paper is shown here where testicular incidence is shown on the y-axis and then year is on the x-axis. Um, and separated by age, so 35 to 39 year olds, 40 to 45 year olds, and 45 to 49 year olds, you can see that all of them have a drop in incidence where this black dot is. And that corresponds to patients that were born during World War II. And so the theory here is that the war resulted in different fetal exposures and therefore changed the incidence of testicular um, cancer. And then there's also so just some geographic synchrony. So in studies of patients in Denmark and Finland, the rate of testes cancer, crypt orchidism, and hypospadias is much lower in Finland. And this corresponds to a worse semen quality in patients in Denmark. Um, so besides the cancer itself impacting male fertility, cancer treatment can result in decreased fertility. So in terms of surgery, uh, in patients with germ cell tumors, as expected, a radical orchiectomy can cause decreased sperm quality and counts. And this is seen uh, as far back as a, a study in the 2000s where semen analysis was compared prior to and after orchiectomy. And this study found that in their 35 patients, 30 had a decreased sperm concentration and up to 9% developed azospermia. And then patients who re require further treatment with an RPL and D have an even bigger effect on their fertility often. And this is because during an RPL and D, there can be disruption of the bilateral retroperitoneal efferent sympathetic nerve fibers that usually arise immediately adjacent to the aorta. And then they travel anterior and form the hypogastric plexus um, and provide sympathetic innervation to the seminal vesicles and the, and the bladder neck um, required for successful anti-grade ejaculation. Um, but there are, are robust studies for nerve sparing, either using a unified, uh, sorry, a unilateral modified template as uh, shown here in images from Hinman's. So uh, the, the uh, bilateral template compared to a unilateral template where you're trying to also spare the hypogastric plexus. And in a study, a multicenter trial from the 1990s, um, this has been shown to improve anti-grade ejaculation from about 34 to 74%. Alternatively, a bilateral nerve spare can be done where you uh, identify and spare the sympathetic chains. And here there's pretty robust evidence that anti-grade ejaculation rates are actually very good um, between 88 to 100% with good cancer survival. And then just a quick note that it's also important not to forget about fertility and other urologic oncology surgeries, even though patients are usually older. Um, however, about 25% of patients diagnosed with bladder cancer are less than 65 at time of diagnosis, and therefore there are still a proportion of patients who could desire fertility. And then a study was done in patients with prostate cancer on, on 510 patients undergoing radical prostatectomy in Italy, and they were surveyed to see if anybody would be interested in sperm banking and actually found that 20% of their patients would be interested Although this is, uh, it is interesting if you actually look at age of the patient, because the mean age was 62 to 65. So unclear what, uh, what their, if their banked sperm was actually used in the end. Um, but both radical prostatectomy and cystectomy obviously result in obstructive azospermia. And there, there have been a couple uh, just small studies looking at options for fertility sparing surgery, but the effects on oncological outcomes for these are unknown. So just an example of this is there's a seminal sparing cystectomy, which a couple centers have tried. And the idea here is that the posterior bladder dissection is seen in the, the image is anterior to the seminal vesicle plane to preserve the vas deferens, the seminal vesicles and the prosthetic capsule. And the idea here is that the entire bladder and the prosthetic urethelium are removed. Um, but injury to the nerves and is avoided and the seminal vesicles are left in continuity. And if you look at a summary of 
studies that have tried this technique. Uh, potency is around 60 to 100 percent. And uh, although they report a high grade of ejaculation, the, the rate of retrograde ejaculation is very high. The only study that looked at them separately only had a 20 percent rate of anti-grade ejaculation. And then there's a second alternative, which is shown in one small study of four patients where only the vas deferens were spared, and then the vas deferens were actually re-implanted into the bulb or urethra. And in these four patients, uh, two had preserved anti-grade ejaculation, and then one of them was actually uh, successfully had an offspring. But again, oncological outcomes were not examined. Um, radiation can also have an effect on fertility. And just to jump back into spermatogenesis briefly, um, an overview, so at puberty, GnRH uh, triggers the release of LH and FSH from the pituitary. LH will stimulate Leydig cells while FSH stimulates Sertoli cells. And these both result in rapid meiotic division of the spermatogonial stem cells or SSC into the spermatogonia, spermatocytes, spermatids, and then spermatozoa. Um, and then uh, since both radiation and chemotherapy target usually the most rapidly dividing cells in the body, you can see from this image kind of all the areas that they target, but often they result in gonadotoxic effects because they uh, largely affect the spermatogonial stem cells as well as the spermatogonia. Um, so in terms of radiation, a study back in 1974 was the first to really quantify the effect. And they did this by uh, recruiting 67 healthy volunteers whose fertility was treated or tested before treatment. And then they had each of these volunteers um, put their, their testicle into this cup in the machine that they built to uh, receive different doses of radiation. And then after the testicle was irradiated, they again measured uh, sperm concentration, mo motility, morphology, and then um, also things like testosterone levels. And in their surgery, or sorry, in their study, they mostly focused on dose response and recovery times. And uh, their, their results are summarized in this table here. But you can see that even very low doses of radiation can result in oligospermia that can last nine to 18 months, whereas higher doses can cause azoospermia that lasts over five years. And just for some context, there have been several studies that look at the actual testicular radiation doses during radiation therapy for various malignancies. So patients for, who get external beam radiation for prostate cancer can get uh, one to 10 gray to the testicle, which is decreased by 50% if proper shielding is done, but uh, can still be significant. Bracket therapy is lower at only 0.18. Testicular cancer patients get about 0.5 to 5 gray of radiation, and then Hodgkin's lymphoma was about 0.3 to 1.3 with shielding. And so a patient, in, or sorry, a study in, in 2006 was done looking at the effect of testicular cancer treatment on uh, DNA damage in sperm, and, and they included 29 patients who received adjuvant radiotherapy to the paraaortic and iliac lymph nodes. Uh, with an average age of 36. With testicular shielding, the testicles received less than 0.5 gray of radiation. So if we just look at this, this previous study, this puts them kind of in this lower risk uh, group. And they found that angivant radiation caused a decrease in the median sperm concentration, uh, as well as an increase in the proportion of sperm with DNA strand breaks, as seen in this table here. And they actually measured DNA strand breaks with something called the sperm chromatin structure assay, DNA fragmentation index, or SCSA. Um, and there's actually evidence that an SCSA level of greater than 27% can significantly impair in vivo fertilization, down to almost 0% with natural conception and intrauterine insemination. And so the same study looked at patients who still had normal sperm counts and found that uh, the the proportion of patients who had an SCSA of greater than 
um, it was only 7% in controls and 38, up to 38% in patients who received radiation. So this is an 8.5 fold increase, meaning that even if patients after radiation have normal sperm counts, their fertility can be impaired. And this was only a transient effect. So there's usually recovery within three to five years. But since the median age of patients was 36, uh, this can still have consequences in terms of fatherhood for these patients. So in terms of chemotherapy, the effect on spermatogenesis uh, depends on parameters such as the type of chemotherapy, the dose and initial semen quality. But uh, in 2018, McBride stratified chemotherapy agents by risk of infertility in there. Um, and they put alkylating agents as well as platinum agents, so carboplatin, cisplatin, in the very high risk group. Patients receiving carboplatin and cisplatin have been found to have almost a 20 to 47% risk of azospermia at five years, depending on the dose of chemotherapy they get. And then other, other chemotherapy agents that we often see, such as gemcitabine, bleomycin, are in the low risk category um, because they generally only have temporary reduction in semen parameters by avoiding damage to the spermatogonial stem cells. But the study states that essentially there's no chemotherapy agent that has no risk of infertility. Um, and additionally, if multiple chemotherapies are used, there can be an additive effect. Uh, just looking briefly more closely at cisplatin, since that's of particular interest for a lot of urology patients, uh, this is a study from a model of 35 male rats. And here it was seen that both low dose cisplatin and high dose cisplatin decreases testicular weight. Um, it can decrease sperm concentration and motility, and it can also increase the rate of abnormal sperm. Uh, and uh, they also looked at the histology in these rats. And so this is a normal testicle, and then this is a testicle after uh, receiving cisplatin. And you can see that there's degeneration of a lot of the germinal cells, your spermatogenic arrests. And then you can also see that in, in this, there's a lack of any spermatids or spermatocytes. Um, and again, this is all uh, dose dependent. So high doses are, are worse off than low doses. Um, looking directly at the effect of chemotherapy on humans, this is a study looking at uh, bleomycin, atoposide, and cisplatin, so first-line regimen for testicular cancer. And uh, this study included 62 patients who underwent chemotherapy with BEP. Um, uh, and uh, their, their table shows the success rates of sperm recovery. So in patients who receive less than two cycles, um, the, the recovery rate at two years was 86%, whereas patients who received more than two cycles, their recovery was only about 63%. A similar prospective study looked at 182 patients um, who received adjuvant treatment for testicular cancer, which again included 62 patients receiving BEP. And this, the, their BEP patients are shown in the dotted orange line. And you can see that there was no significant difference in, in uh, pre-treatment and post-treatment sperm counts. And the same was actually true for their other treatment modalities other than radiation therapy, which is shown by this orange line where there was a dip in uh, sperm counts immediately after treatment, but this actually recovered back to normal. Um, but it's important to note that in this study, uh, before treatment, a large proportion, so 39% of patients were actually oligospermic. And so the study still recommends sperm banking for these patients. Looking at actual paternity rates after uh, testicular cancer treatment, this is a study that included 451 patients. And before the diagnosis of testicular cancer, patients who tried to conceive um, in the shaded gray had a fertility rate of 91.2% versus after treatment, patients who tried to conceive only had a fertility rate of about 67%. And this study included both chemotherapy and radiotherapy groups, where radiotherapy groups were worse off. 
Um, looking beyond just uh, fertility rates to, to see if chemotherapy has an effect of DNA mutation rates. Uh, this is a study done in 2015, which included two families who had children before chemotherapy and after chemotherapy. And um, so this is the child before chemotherapy in family A and before chemotherapy in family B, and then the ch child after and two children after uh, treatment. And they found that the mutation rates, the DNA mutation rates were not significantly different between the children before and after. And in fact, the mutation rates were about within, uh, sorry, were within 95% competence interval for patients of that age. Um, very briefly on other systemic therapies. So for example, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, the evidence is very limited, but there are studies uh, or there were, it was a systematic review in 2020 that looked at fertility in patients who received TKIs. And um, they found they mostly looked at imatinib and found that it can disrupt the normal signaling, signaling of latex cells. Um, resulting in apoptosis and oligospermia, but usually the exposure to medication actually did not disrupt the process of spermatogenesis, and so future fertility was protected. And then other TKIs uh, listed here are actually often uh, have a too large molecular weight, so they aren't able to cross the blood testes barrier and have no effect on male fertility. Um, and then the, the data is actually even more limited for immune checkpoint inhibitors, but a known complication of, of these uh, medications is pituitary insufficiency. So this can result in hypogonadism, but the effect of this directly on uh, patient, patient fertility is, hasn't really been studied. And then there are there is a handful, a small, small handful of very small cohorts that suggests that male patients usually actually have preserved fertility but uh, there can be what they call inflammatory impairment of spermatogenesis. And in both cases, authors actually recommend that cryopreservation should just be done. Um, looking at uh, birth defects in, in patients with, or in offsprings of patients with cancer, um, there've been a couple large population-based studies. Um, one example of this is a study looking at 4,699 offsprings of cancer survivors, and they looked at patients who received chemo versus no chemo and who received radiation versus no radiation. And here, there was no significant difference uh, in birth defects between the groups. Um, this contrasts to a second study um, which compared all singleton children born alive in Denmark and Sweden between around 1995 and 2005. And they included a total of 8,670 patients who had a paternal history of cancer. And here the prevalence actually increased from 3.2 to 3.7% with this history of cancer. Um, but unfortunately, there is no data on treatment modali modality for these patients. So despite the fact that there's pretty clear effects of cancer and cancer treatment on male fertility, um, there have been multiple studies that demonstrate that the counseling and referral rates for these patients are actually very low. So for example, a retrospective review shown here of 201 patients aged uh, 13 to 50 years who received a new cancer diagnosis and were going to undergo curative chemotherapy. I uh, showed that only about 59 of these patients were counseled. And even if they were counseled, the attempted banking, sperm banking rates were low. Um, this table from the same study is just uh, a, a bit nice because patients with genitourinary uh, cancers actually have a higher rate of counseling than the others. So 64% compared to rates as low as 4.8%. And so accordingly, both the EUA and the ASCO guidelines state that men with cancer should be offered sperm cryopreservation prior to the use of donatotoxic agents or ablative surgery, which may impair spermatogenesis. And uh, ideally, the sperm cryopreservation should be done prior to orchiectomy if it is testicular cancer. However, orchiectomy should not be delayed. So in terms of how to actually go about fertility preservation, 
Usually it's broken down into two different groups. So those patients who have undergone puberty, where the, the mainstay is kind of sperm cryopreservation and those who are pre-pubertal, um, which we'll touch on later, but it's slightly more complicated because they don't have mature sperm yet. And so in order to determine, um, sorry, therefore it's important to determine spermarchy in, in patients who are around 11 to 16, because it's not always totally clear which category they belong in. Um, this can be difficult because for young boys and their parents, they often feel awkward having, having conversations about spermarchy. And they can often feel that it's not super important after having just received a cancer diagnosis. However, um, it is it is important to attempt to discuss, and uh, it's also been been uh, shown that it can actually provide families with hope because they can think about something after the cancer has been cured. And there there have been studies looking at which uh, or predictors of of which patients might have successful semen collection, and some indicators were patients who have had their first conscious ejaculation having a testicular volume greater than five and masturbation. Um, for patients who have reached puberty, masturbation is the easiest way to deliver sperm for preservation. And a study of over 4,000 patients who are less than 20 years old referred to the French National Sperm Banking Network after a cancer diagnosis found that uh, 86% of pubertal boys um, were able to successfully deliver a semen sample by masturbation. But it is important to, to note that when these patients were separated by age, the, the younger patients, 11 to 14-year-olds, um, only had a 65% success rate. And then when you actually look at semen para parameters, um, they had lower sperm counts, concentration, and motility than older patients. If... Uh, if um, masturbation is unsuccessful, then assisted ejaculatory methods are attempted. So first line here is penile vibratory stimulation. And this can be performed by patients themselves, although it's usually quite uncomfortable if they have normal skin sensation. And so it's mainly used in the spinal cord populations, or it can be done by the physician in under anesthesia. And then uh, in terms of, of Younger patients who are just pubertal, there's actually minimal evidence for these patients. So in that last study that I showed, there were only three patients who attempted PVS and all three cases were unsuccessful in obtaining sperm. And then there's another small case report uh, looking at two patients where one out of two had success with PVS. The other option here is electroejaculation, which is more invasive because here, as seen in the diagram, a rectal probe is inserted, um, which allows electrodes to contact the, the rectal mucosa in the area of the prostate and the seminal vesicles. And then alternating pattern of uh, stimulations are supposed to trigger antegrade ejaculation. Uh, often there's also some retrograde ejaculation. So catheterization of the bladder is generally performed to retrieve sperm after the procedure. And it's been shown that it is very safe with no rectal injuries in a series of 915 patients. And in the general population is pretty effective between 60 to 100%. But again, in, in younger patients who've just reached puberty, the success is a, a little bit lower at about 67%. Um, so if patients, if ej assisted ejaculation fails or, or patients aren't uh, suitable for ejaculation, or if they're azospermic, even after ejaculate is obtained, we have to go to some to surgical sperm retrieval options. And uh, these include either testicular sperm aspiration or TESA, um, conventional uh, testicular sperm extraction or c tessie and then micro dissection testicular sperm extraction or m tessie And here m tessie involves dissection of the testicle under a microscope as is shown in this diagram here where enlarged tubules are identified and then targeted for sperm extraction. In c tessie a biopsy of the testicular tissue is removed and then postoperatively is dissected to extract sperm. And then uh, in TESA it's just a needle aspiration but this is usually reserved for patients with obstructive azospermia. 
Uh, so, for example, it could be used for patients who've undergone radical prostatectomy or cystectomy. And then uh, in 2015, a systematic review was done to uh, look at the three techniques for patients with non-obstructive azospermia, and they found that mTSI had the highest likelihood of success, which is unsurprising. But it is important to remember that uh, using mTSI, uh, it requires a intraoperative microscopy, so it can be a longer operative time more and more costly and difficult to arrange, which isn't ideal in patients where you're trying to get them uh, a treatment for uh, cancer. Um, the alternative that's been suggested is something called oncotessy. And uh, here, essentially, the extraction is performed at the same time of the orchiectomy. There have been a couple case reports. So this is a case report of three patients where uh, sperm extraction was successful in two patients. And there was a live birth in one of these patients using this technique. And then this is a second case report case series of six patients where sperm retrieval was successful in four out of six um, patients, and uh, two of these patients achieved pregnancy. The drawback here is that the safety hasn't been closely examined. And also, if, if you're performing a TESI on the orchiectomy specimen, it can interfere with the pathologist's ability to stage the testicular tumor. So once sperm are obtained, usually they undergo cryopreservation, which can actually further affect sperm quality. So this is a 16-year single-center study looking at 721 patients who were uh, underwent cryopreservation. And as expected, the concentration of sperm went down because uh, cryo or cryoprotectant was added. Um, but there was also a drop in motility of the sperm as well as vitality of the sperm. Despite this, uh, a study looking at how sperm were used after cryopreservation in 898 patients showed that 96 of these patients used their sperm and the achieved parenthood rate or success rate was about 77% with a total of 94 children born, um, which means that despite a decreased sperm quality, cryo is still actually relatively effective. Um, in these patients, 34% got rid of their sperm and 55% actually still had their sperm in storage. And here it's, it's interesting just to note that the patients who had their sperm in storage um, had only stored their sperm for an average of about seven years compared to those that were destroyed or used where it was 13.3. Um, so there's a good chance that that more of these would be would would have been used if there were a longer follow-up. And then just another interesting study done in 2018. Um, looking at the costs of sperm banking. So here, uh, 44 studies were compiled that looked at pregnancy and cancer patients after cryopreservation. And the cost of each patient's pregnancy was estimated depending on, on what the cost of microtessy might be um, and what the duration of sperm banking would be. And uh, they, they modeled the the costs where red essentially was patients where it would be more expensive to bank and blue is patients where they would save money by banking sperm. And you can see that that patients with testicular cancer who undergo active surveillance um, for the majority of patients, it was cheaper for them not to bank than to bank. Uh, if you compare this to other treatment options, so patients who received RPL and DIA over here, the graph looks very similar where it's often cheaper not to bank. But then once you get into to patients receiving chemotherapy or, or radiation therapy, then it's generally cheaper um, for them to undergo uh, banking. Um, but it is important to note that in, in the same study, the overall probability of achieved pregnancy was higher in the cryopreservation brain, uh, branch than the non-cryopreservation branch. And this is true even for patients on active surveillance um, or who received RPLND. Uh, so for patients who've not gone through puberty yet, fertility preservation is a lot more complicated because they don't have hap haploid uh, uh, sperm 
cells and this they, they do have spermatogonial stem cells though which means that there's still this possibility of preserving uh their spermatogonial stem cells and then later restoring fertility and there are lots of experimental methods looking at this including testicular tissue engraftment um ssc auto transplantation and then in vitro spermatogenesis so in terms of engraftment the thought here is that testicular tissue is harvested uh from patients before treatment and then cryopreserved. After treatment and after puberty, the testicular tissue is then grafted under the skin of the patients where spermatogenesis should start to occur. And then these sperm can be taken uh, for, for uh, fertility or for insemination. And um, it's been demonstrated that it is a successful method in, in both mouse and monkey studies. Uh, for example, in, in 2019, a study was performed where uh, the testicular tissues were grafted under the skin in the back and the scrotum of uh, monkeys. And over 8 to 12 months, the grafts grew as shown here, and they started producing testosterone and spermatogenesis was confirmed in all of these grafts. A sperm was used from, from one of these grafts for ICSI, and a healthy female baby shown here was born, demonstrating that it is a viable option, at least uh, in monkeys, but it hasn't been shown in humans yet. Um, the alternative method is auto-transplantation of these stem cells, and here the stem cells are harvested from the prepubertal tissue and then cryopreserved. Uh, later, after puberty and treatment, they're then injected into the RET testes, as shown here. There's a needle and then injects it into the RET testes um, under ultrasound guidance. And then they migrate to the basal lamina of the seminiferous tubules, so they require intact uh, testicular environments. And this method has been shown to restore spermatogenesis in rats, dogs, cows, and monkeys, and there have been offspring in mice, chicken, and sheep. Um, and it was also validated in a human study in, in 2012, where, or sorry, not a human study, in a monkey study in 2012, where they sterilized 18 adults and, and five prepubertal monkeys with alkylating chemotherapy at time, you know, negative 15 weeks. And then at time zero, they injected the stem cells into the testes and then measured uh, sperm counts following this. And this is just an example of one of these monkeys, but you can see that at about 35 weeks, there is a rise in, uh, in uh, sperm counts in the ejaculation. Um, the difficulty of uh, sperm spermatogonial uh, stem cell transplant is that an estimated 25 million spermatogonia are needed for natural fertility restoration and uh, cryopreserved prepubertal tissue. They only have a limited population. And the so solution here would be propagation in vitro. And there've actually been more than 10 groups that have successfully maintained long-term in vitro proliferation. But again, this could be very costly for patients if it were actually used. And then the third option is in vitro maturation of stem cells. And here the goal is to generate spermatozoa that can be used for ICSI uh, in vitro, which would make the strategy the safest in terms of risk of reintroduction neoplastic cells into the patient. Uh, various studies have been able to describe successful completion of spermatogenesis in uh, prepubertal mice in vitro, but it hasn't really been successful yet in humans. Um, there's a study done by de Michelle that attempted to demonstrate this using immature human testicular tissue from five prepubertal boys. Um, and, and there is a graph of this shown here um, with the five, five boys graphed separately. And here there was actually generation of haploid cells over time, as you can see. But uh, unfortunately, it was only only round spermatids were formed with haploid chromosomal content and spermatogenesis was not completed. It is still promising, though, because uh, the there's been studies that show that you can use round spermatids uh, for fertilization. But uh, we still need to demonstrate the genetic and epigenetic uh, normality of these generated haploid cells. And in order to, to attempt um, to improve this uh, in vitro method, um, 
the the micro environment is very important to support germ cell propagation and differentiation. So an attempt has actually been made to reestablish this micro environment in the in vitro setting through 3D printing. And Dr. Flanagan actually published a, a paper in 2022, which is interesting, where they took a testicular biopsy from one patient who's a 31-year-old with non-obstructive azospermia and dissociated the, the cells from the testicular biopsy into single cells, which were expanded in vitro and then uh, printed into tubular structures, which were uh, akin to seminiferous tubules. And after 24 hours, 94% of these cells were still viable. And uh, it was demonstrated that Sertoli, Latic, and uh, meiotic germ cells were can still present. Um, and then after a period of 12 days, there's actually an increase in germ cell markers, um, which is very promising in, in regards to the future success of in vitro maturation of these uh, stem cells. Um, it's important also to to consider the ethics behind um, pre-pubertal fertility preservation. So, for example, although the cryopreservation preservation of, of uh, stem cells is well established, the methods for actually then obtaining spermatozoa for fertilization is still experimental. And so their potential harms, benefits and risks are pretty uncertain. So families need to be counseled appropriately. Um, and the procedures at this time should only be performed as part of ethically approved studies. And then the other, the other ethical consideration is that it's going to be difficult to provide informed consent. Um, generally, the, the recommendation right now is that uh, the, both the boy and the parent should be involved in the discussion and age-appropriate information should be given. But even if this is done, there can be limited understanding um, for the boy. And so uh, the, the overall decision-making can, can be difficult. Um, just uh, moving on. So besides um, uh, a, a lot of patients who aren't able to go fertility preservation or kind of miss the boat on fertility preservation, a large proportion of these patients will then go on to have infertility after treatment. And at this point, the, the management is very similar to non-oncological patients who present with infertility. So I'm not going to go through it in detail, but there are several nice tables that give an overview of management. And the, the idea is, is mainly that first the cause of infertility needs to be identified. And then, for example, if it's erectile dysfunction, this should be um, addressed directly with appropriate uh, um, medications. But a lot of patients in the end will uh, still then be have uns or still be infertile and uh, require um, sperm retrieval options that we previously discussed. And just some practicality. So this is something I actually just learned last block on, on St. Paul's. But if you do have a patient who comes in with uh, like a new diagnosis of a testicular cancer, you can refer them to the Olive Fertility Clinic super easily by just essentially Googling it. And then um, if you click on the link that's refer patients for fertility treatment, you can fill in patient information, referring doctor information, um, and then you just click urgent um, that they're in for fertility preservation and cancer, and then they can be set up with an appointment to discuss uh, fertility preservation. So it can make our lives very easy um, to get patients set up with that. Um, and just briefly coming soon, so there's also a new formalized fertility preservation program in the works for the BC and Yukon that uh, Dr. Flanagan is working on as well. And here um, it's currently run by a steering committee that's comprised of a ver variety of patients. So physicians from BC Children's Hospital, BC Cancer Agency, urologists, and then reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialists who are working with the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer and this will hopefully just make things a lot more streamlined um, and provide more patients with uh, access to fertility preservation methods.